So what I want to do is I want to talk to you a little bit about the anointing in God's presence um, because there is an anointing of the Holy Spirit. There is a presence of God that God wants to put on every one of our lives. And so for every single person, the Lord wants to set his hand on you. And when he does that, it's a super powerful moment in a person's life. It's, it's transformative. It changes you when the presence of God comes on you. One of my favorite stories is in the Old Testament. I'm going to bring it up because we don't have time to look at it in depth. But it's the story of Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And in chapter 9, it, we're introduced to Saul. And Saul is, is anything but a spiritual man. In fact, when you read chapter 9, it, 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 things don't look good for Saul because Saul is, he has lost his donkeys, which would be like a, a farmer losing his tractors. You know, if in, in that day, if you couldn't keep track of your livestock, um, if you're not a good shepherd, if you can't keep track of the animals, uh, that doesn't bode well because a lot of the great leaders in the kingdom were great shepherds. I mean, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David. David. I mean, it goes on and on. And so Saul, we right away find out he's not, um, he's not very capable. And then you find out as well, he's not a spiritual man because he faces a problem and he doesn't seek a spiritual solution. So he looks for three days, can't find his donkeys, and he has a servant with him. And the servant is the one who says, hey, we should go see the seer, S-E-E-R, the prophet. Maybe he can tell us where they're at. And so uh, Saul didn't think of that. The servant thinks of it. So Saul's like, yeah, hey, let's do it. I don't have anything to give. So even the servant's having to pay the prophet for his services. And so uh, they get there. And when they go, they're going to go see Samuel. And Samuel, the Bible has already said at this point about Samuel that in those days, not one of his words fell to the ground. I mean, when he spoke, everybody listened. He is the spiritual leader of the nation. Um, he is... Uh, uh, going throughout the country, judging, uh, you know, holding court, teaching the people, leading people forward uh, towards a closer walk with God. And the interesting thing is Samuel lives five miles from Saul. So it's, you know, it's not a long ways, especially in that day. He lives five miles from him. But when he meets Samuel, Saul doesn't even know who he is. He goes up to him and he says, hey, can you tell us where the seer is? And Samuel says, I'm the seer, I'm the prophet. So here's a guy who has zero spiritual interest. It's a guy who's not a very capable leader. It's a guy who doesn't think in terms of spiritual solutions to his problems. But Samuel anoints him as king of Israel. And here's what happens. Samuel says, the spirit of God will come upon you. And when he does, you'll be changed into a different person. Then he says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it. So whatever it is, I mean, that's a dangerous thing for a guy who's been very inept up to this point in his life, which tells us that God, when his hand comes upon us and his hand can come on anybody. Now, sometimes we have the idea that his hand is only going to come on people. I think his, his hand more frequently, more regularly, and at times more powerfully comes on people who are walking very close to him, but there's nobody in this room that you couldn't have the presence of the Lord come on you and in that moment change you and, and, and help you to accomplish a task that's really beyond you. I mean, Saul, the very first thing he does, he leads the nation of Israel to defeat a 300-year foe. The Ammonites leads them in a powerful victory. Even Samuel couldn't do that. Why? Because the anointing, the, the presence of the Lord came on him. It changed him. When God's hand comes on you, it makes you different. Really what all of us should want then is to have the anointing, to have the Holy Spirit resting on us. We could understand the anointing this way. It's the presence of the Holy Spirit resting on us for the purpose of ministry, or we could say for the purpose of fulfilling God's will for our life. I would say this, you need the anointing to do your job. You need the anointing to be a parent. You need the anointing, you need the leading, the prompting of the Lord to make decisions in our life. We all benefit when we have the Holy Spirit working on us. 
The anointing also means, the word can literally mean in the Hebrew, being smeared. It's like being smeared with oil. So that, have you ever gotten oil on you and then you're like, it's all over and, and so like whatever you touch, it leaves a residue? That's how it is in the anointing. When the hand of the Lord is on you, wherever you go, it leaves a residue of his presence in the places where you've been. I remember when, when um, uh, early, in the early days of the church, there, it, they were just developing Turnberry Estates over near the church, near Hopedale Church. And there was a family in the church that uh, they were one of the first ones to buy a home in there. And they were having a little party. And so uh, they'd invited Debbie and I. And so we got there. And there were already a lot of people in the house. And so they were letting people walk to their house. And, you know, it was just kind of a housewarming party. And so as we're walking through the house, all of a sudden the hostess, the people hosting it, she says, <gasps> because they have white carpets all over. Who got oil all over the carpet? And there's like these footprints going all over the house on this white carpet. And everybody all of a sudden is like, <gasps> and everybody's going like this, and they're looking at their feet. And I look at mine. <laughs> and it was me. Talk about in that moment, just like feeling mortified, feeling ill, feeling like, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Everywhere, I had oil on my feet, so everywhere I went, there was oil. Now you say, what happened? Well, we had the carpets cleaned and praise the Lord. <laughs> it all came out. But what happens is when there's oil on you, it gets on the places where you go. There's evidence of that oil on your life in the places where you've walked and the places where you've been. And God wants to set his anointing on us and use us, not just in a service, but through the week. Maybe the question is, why do some people have more of an anointing on their life than others? I would say, number one, it's because they place a high value on the presence of God. They desire the things of God. And when you desire the things of God, what happens is, number two, you walk in a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Some people are frankly just extremely conscious of the Holy Spirit, how he feels about their words, how he feels about their attitudes, how he feels about their activities. Listen, if you're grieving the Holy Spirit, if we're grieving him by what we say, what we do, where we go, by the, by the things we're thinking about, then you're not going to have the presence of the Lord on your life to the degree that you would. I'm not saying you're not, I, I think there are gradients and we can decide in a very real sense how much of God's hand is on our life by how we choose to live in relationship to him and in sensitivity to his voice. So that what happens is the Holy Spirit is, is on us and he's on us for ministry. And then as we go through the day or as we're in places, then our job is to take what he has given us and release it into the lives of others, right? Jesus said, Matthew chapter 10, to the disciples, he said, freely you've received, freely give. So God has given to you, if God sets his hand on us, it's because God wants to release what he's poured into us into the lives of other people. And in that sense, it's a wonderful thing to think if the hand of God is on you and the presence of the Lord is working in you, that then you become simply a conduit and we become a conduit for his power to flow through us into the lives of other people. So just quickly, how, how can we release that into people's lives? How do you release the anointing that is on you? Because if you and I spend time in the presence of the Lord, hey, you're here tonight. Your life's going to be different to tomorrow because you were here tonight. You're watching online. Your life's going to be different tomorrow because you were in the presence of the Lord. That's how it works. When you're with God, then it's obvious that you have been with God. I mean, Moses goes up on the mountain, and when he comes down, his face shines with, shines with the glory of God. Why? He was in the presence of God so long that his body physically reflects that presence. So you're going to be different. All of us are marked in a very real sense because we were here tonight, which is great news. You're marked. It's another reason why you want to be in the presence of the Lord when you start your day, when you end your day, so that, that your, his hand is on you. 
but his hand is on you, you are blessed. We are blessed to be a blessing, right? We're blessed so that he can, he pours himself into us that we might release him and release that power and that grace to people around us. How do we do that? Well, I'm gonna give you six ways real quick. Number one, the word of God. Luke chapter 24 and verse 32, this is the road to Emmaus. After Jesus breaks the bread, he walks along two disciples. They don't recognize him. They're kept from recognizing him. He acts like he's going to keep on walking. They say, hey, no, spend the night with us. They sit down to the table. As they're getting ready to eat, he breaks the bread. When he does, they instantly recognize him. He's gone. But they say this, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? In other words, what happens is, as the Word of God is being explained, the Spirit of God is working through the Word of God. When you, went, when you bring God's Word into a situation, you're releasing God's power into that situation. When you're talking to somebody and you're giving them counsel, don't just give them your best advice. Give them godly advice based on the Word of God. Don't just say, well, you know, I think you ought to do that. How about say, you know what, the Bible says this, because when you bring the Bible into the equation, suddenly the presence of God is released in their life to do a work. I mean, we know that because Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, for the Word of God is alive and it's powerful. When you release that into somebody's life, powerful things happen. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, it gets right to the heart of things. It brings God's power. It brings God's anointing. It brings God's grace. If you want God to invade somebody's life, give them the word of God. It says between the joint and the marrow, it exposes the innermost thoughts and desires. It gets right to the bottom of things. How powerful is it? Well, Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. We are transformed through the living and enduring word of God. It's so powerful that as people hear the word of God, it takes them and moves them from darkness into light. That's how powerful. It actually exposes people to the anointing, to the presence, to the grace of God in their life. Give people the word of God and watch what God does in their life. That's why it's good to be in the scripture as well, because then you can say, you know, I was reading today, and as I was reading today, I was reading this, this passage, and this was the story. And, and oftentimes what will happen is, as you're walking close to the Lord, the things you're studying are the things God's going to want you to share with others to bless their life the way God has blessed your life, right? Well, number two, an act of faith can release the presence of God. Faith brings a release of God's presence. And an act of faith is any action on the outside that demonstrates faith on the inside. So in the Old Testament, when you have the uh, nation of Israel and they're marching around Jericho and they're doing that, and Joshua says, listen, on the, on the seventh day, you're going to march around the city seven times, and on the seventh time, when you hear the trumpet sound, you're going to give a shout of praise, and then the walls are going to come down. You would think he would say, the walls are going to fall down when the trumpet sounds, and then you'll praise but that's not how it works. It took an act of faith on their part of saying, God, I thank you the city is already ours, though nothing physically would indicate that. Spiritually, you've already given it to us, and I'm praising you now spiritually before I see it physically, and it's that act of faith that releases the power and the presence of God to accomplish the miracle. That's how it works. So as you and I are, are acting in faith, an exa another example would be John chapter 9 and verse 1, where Jesus was walking along. He sees a man who had been blind from birth, and there's a discussion. The disciples are asking who sinned, his parents or him, that he was born blind. And Jesus said, neither, but that the glory of God might be displayed. And again, this is Jesus' passage where he says he's the light of the world. So that metaphor, that, that idea is, is really illustrated in the miracle. He spit on the ground, Jesus did, made mud with saliva, spread the mud over the man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. It was an example of faith. 
that you can release the presence of God when you give somebody, he's got mud on his eyes, wash the mud off, and when you wash the mud off, you're gonna be able to see. We would, we would uh, say it's an act of faith in Peter's case when he heals the paralytic at the gate beautiful. He says, silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have I give unto you. Rise up and walk. Nothing's happened at that point. But he takes hold of the man's hand and pulls him up. It's an act of faith on Peter's part and on the man's part that results in the power of God being demonstrated in his body in an amazing way. There's a value at times. Sometimes God calls you to do an act of faith. Sometimes you're going to pray for somebody and you're going to ask for an act of faith. Do what you couldn't do. It's an act of faith that releases the presence of God into somebody's life. A third way of releasing his presence is a prophetic act. And a prophetic act is different from an act of faith in that a prophetic act doesn't have any connection to the desired outcome. For example, if you ask somebody to walk on an ankle that was injured, you're asking them to do something that is related to the outcome, right? That the ankle would be healed. A prophetic act has no connection. Here would be an example in Scripture, 2 Kings chapter 6. Elisha is with the prophets, and they're, they're going to build a bigger area. They have a school of the prophets, so they're teaching uh, men to, to be prophets. And so they need a bigger lodge to meet in. They ask Elisha to go. He says, sure, I'll go. As they're there, one of the prophets is sitting there, and he's chopping. And as he chops and he swings the ax back, the head falls off and falls in the Jordan River. The man is immediately mortified because it's not his ax. He's borrowed it. He obviously doesn't have enough money to go buy another one. It would be a very costly purchase on his part. And so he cries out and he says, my Lord, that the ax has fallen in the river and I, it's not mine. And Elisha says, where did it fall? And the man, the man of God asked. And when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick, threw it into the water at that spot. Then the ax head floated to the surface. You can throw sticks in the water all day long and ax heads aren't going to float. <laughs> but in that moment, it's a prophetic act that releases God's power into the situation to resolve it. For example, we do this all the time. You say, when do we do it? Every time we tell people to come into the altar, it's a prophetic act. Is there more power here than there is in the back of the auditorium? What's the answer to that? No. But there's something about the prophetic act of coming forward that releases the power of God into the lives of those who come forward. I, I mean, all of us have experienced that at one time or another. If you haven't, you ought to try it. You'll be like really wowed by it. I mean, sometimes it's not, you don't even feel it happen in that moment, but the next day you realize, I'm, I'm totally different. I was thinking one way, I was all tied up in knots over something, and all of a sudden I have not only a peace, I have a confidence, and I have a sense that God is with me on this that I didn't have before. I can't manufacture it on my own, but I was in the presence of the Lord, and he changed me. Or you come forward, and, and by coming forward, something happens in your life that releases God's presence in your life. Sometimes it's the act of touch. Oral Roberts, when I was at, at ORU, I remember him talking repeatedly. One of the things he felt strongly about was the presence of God is released through what he would call a point of contact. That when he would touch somebody, when he would lay hands on somebody, it would release the power of God into their life to resolve whatever it is they were facing. You see that in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 2. This is the story of Jesus. He meets a man with leprosy who approached him and knelt before him and said, Lord, the man said, if you're willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. He didn't have to do that. 
But in that moment, he did it. It's the release. And as he does, he says, I'm willing, be healed. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared. There's an act of touch that releases the power of God. You know, the woman with the issue of blood, she said, we looked at that last week relative to the word sozo, the idea of healing. And she said, if only I can touch him, the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Jesus said, somebody touched me and power flowed out of me. So there is certainly a sense where when hands are laid on you, so whether you're at an ordination service where hands are being laid, there is a transfer of God's blessing, anointing, and power prophetically, supernaturally on that person's life. You can pray over somebody and as you set your hands on them in a prophetic moment, release a gift of God in them they didn't even know they had. Paul says that. He says, fan into flame the gift of God that was given you through what? The laying on of hands, through touch. It transferred something into his life. When, when we anoint people with oil, there's, there's a value in the touch. As you set your hand on them, as you anoint them with oil. Uh, Mark chapter, before we go there, Mark chapter 6 and verse 56, whenever, wherever he went, in the villages or in the cities or the countryside, they brought the sick out to the marketplaces. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. I mean, whenever somebody touched him, there was a, there was a release of power. So they're touching him, he's touching them. Power is coming from him. And again, I remind you, you say, well, he's God, so that's why that happens. No, Jesus set aside the prerogatives of his deity and functioned under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He said, I only do what I see my Father doing. And so he's spending time with the Father, spending time in his presence, and he is anointed by the Holy Spirit. And a part of that anointing is, as people touch him, they're healed. So there's a value you can release in somebody's life. God's healing power. James chapter 5 says, Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and to pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. That's, they're going to touch you. They're going to set their hand on you. Maybe you're not from a background where people do that, and you've seen, us, you've seen it happen here. It happens every Sunday morning uh, pretty much without uh, exception. Every now and then there's a Sunday where we might not, but typically, and as they're praying, they're touching your head. Yeah. They're touching you. They're hold, they might hold your hand. They're touching you because there's a release of God's power that happens through touch. In fact, right now, I, I would like us to pause in the message. We're going to come back to it, but I'd like the musicians to come up because I really feel like God wants to heal some people. He wants to touch you. So you've heard the, the Lord works and he works through the word of God. He works through an act of faith. So for some of you, the act of faith is going to be doing what you couldn't normally do. As people declare over you God's healing, as they not only pray for you to be healed, but in some cases declare your healing. As people touch you. And so... What I'm going to ask you to do right now is I'm going to ask you if you need healing, I want you to step into the aisle. How many believe God can heal you? God heals, right? He heals. He does. I just believe we're in a season where, where the Lord wants to do that in the lives of people and we're watching him do it over and over again. You know, we had a, a staff member whose back was healed today. We had another uh, person whose knee had been really messed up and was healed. And then we had several uh, people whose ankles, uh, there was a word of knowledge in their ankles. And I mean, they were crying as they were talking about what they could do in that moment and uh, how God healed them because he's a God who heals another, another person that had surgery and it, it really messed them up and they were unable to move in certain ways. And in that moment they were healed. They were, I mean, in the meeting uh, at noon today with tears 
say, I can't believe this. I haven't been able to do this. And they were touching their toes and doing all kinds of things, which is really exciting to see. And I tell you that because I just want you to know there's a healer in the house. And I really, I mean, all day I've just been excited about what God's going to do here and what he did at noon. I mean, we walked in there and I just felt he's going to heal. I just know he is. And then we saw him do it. And so um, what we'd like to do now is you're sitting down. You see some of the people standing. Maybe you know why they're standing, but we'd like everybody to have somebody praying for them. So um, I'm going to ask those who are in the aisles to raise your hand just because that way it helps people who are looking to pray for somebody to make sure. So everybody who's got your hand raised, we want to have somebody come alongside them and pray for them right now. Okay, would you do that? Just okay, let's... Let's, and listen, you know what? You may never have laid hands on somebody and that you don't have to be like an experienced person with healing. All you have to do is, is just, just begin to pray and ask God to do it. He does it. And in some sense, I mean, especially those who, are, who have this understanding, sometimes you command the healing. You say, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Okay, now... I want you, you don't find out what the need is, but you don't need to, if you're the one telling the need, you don't need to give them a long diagnosis. It, let's keep it short. Um, let's, let's just tell them, hey, I need, I need my back healed, my ankle healed. You don't need to tell all the surgeries or everything, all the problems. Let's just tell them right now, and then let's begin to pray, okay? You begin to call on God. Let's pray. Okay, just quickly, how, how many you think you were healed tonight? You feel like you got his touch tonight. Would you wave your hand really, really big so we can see it? That's awesome. Praise the Lord. Let's sing, let's worship the Lord, and then we're gonna come back, we'll finish the message. stay up here with me because we're going we're gonna to just cover a couple more ways to release God's power. 
You know, one of the, I think one of the more underappreciated ways to release the presence of the Lord into people's lives is through compassion, caring for people. You know, there's something that can happen when we have a compassionate heart that can really change a situation. Uh, there's a story in Act or in uh, First, Second Kings, excuse me, chapter six, and that's that chapter is really known primarily as, you know, Elisha is warning the king of Israel where the king of Aram or Syria is positioning his troops. And so the king of Syria says to his advisors, he says, okay, who's the spy? Who's telling the king of Israel what's happening? And his, his generals and his advisors say, there's, it's none of us. There's a prophet by the name of Elisha and he can tell the king of Israel the very conversations you have in your bedroom at night. And so the king says, well, that's going to stop. Where's he at? They say, well, he's in a city called Dothan. So the king of Syria sends his army and he surrounds Dothan, the city. And you read the story in the morning, the, the servant of Elisha's going out to get water. And as he goes out to get water, he sees all around the city. It's encircled by the army of Syria. And he cries out to Elisha, he says, my Lord, what are we going to do? And Elisha says this. He says, Lord, open his eyes. And when the servant's eyes are opened, he sees chariots of fire surrounding the city. Just such an encouragement. You may feel outnumbered. You may feel that, that you're up against it and you're being overwhelmed. But if you could open your eyes, you would see the, you would see the angelic forces of heaven surrounding you. The Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear him. So, so he's there. He's with you. So anyway, what happens is they see that. And then in 2 Kings 6 and verse 18, as the Aramean army advanced toward him, Elisha prayed, oh Lord, please make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. Now it's not a blindness like suddenly they can't see because that's not what's happening as we read this story. What he's saying is God, change their perception, change what they see, how they see it, how they perceive. Now watch what happens. When Elisha went out and told them, you've come the wrong way. This isn't the city. This isn't the right city. It's kind of like, um, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi. These aren't the droids you're looking for. Okay. Follow me. I'll take you to the man you're looking for. And he led them into the city of Samaria. That's the capital of Israel. And as soon as they entered the Samaria, Elisha prayed, oh Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they discovered that they were in the middle of Samaria. Then the king of Israel saw them. He shouted to Elisha, my father, should I kill them? Should I kill them? Of course not, Elisha replied. Do we kill prisoners of war? Give them food and drink and send them home again to their master. In other words, be kind to the people who are attacking you. Be kind to the people who've surrounded you to do you in. And watch what happens here. So the king made a great feast for them, not just a little, he gave them a lot. He made a feast for them and then sent them home to their master. And after that, the Aramean raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. Compassion stopped their attack. Compassion released the power of God in a way that changed what they saw, then changed what they did. And there's some here tonight, and the answer to your problem is going to be you exercising a compassion through the grace of God that's going to release the power of God into that situation and it's going to take somebody who was an enemy and it's going to change the way they see you and the way they see the circumstance and is ultimately through your compassion going to change the way they respond to you. I believe that's a word for somebody here tonight, somebody watching online or somebody in the room. And then one last one. 
Worship is another way to release, and we understand this. Second Chronicles chapter 20. This is such a great worship pa passage. They're surrounded. They've got an overwhelming alliance of armies coming against them. Jehoshaphat, who's been a good king, a godly king, who's seen God do a lot of miracles, he is very afraid. And he prays and he says, Lord, we don't know what to do. Our eyes are on you. And in the next morning, a prophet comes and says, what you need to do is you need to, you need to go out praising the Lord and, and put your worship choir at the front of your army. It doesn't make any sense, but it's a word from the Lord. And watch what happens. The singers, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang, give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. So here they are, they're going into battle. They're being attacked. The threat of being wiped out is very real. And what are they saying? God, I just thank you because you are so faithful. Your faithful love endures forever. When's the last time you were facing a problem and you thought, you thought, I don't know what I'm gonna do and you just stopped and said, you know what? There's an enemy coming against me, but I thank you, Lord, because your faithful love endures forever. I thank you, God, because you've never let me down and I'm just worshiping you. Watch what happens. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. At the very moment they started to praise, at the very moment you and I are beginning to worship the Lord, God is gonna do something powerful in your life. So again, I wanna do something that I believe is a, because there are needs here that are beyond healing. Some of you need, need the Lord to give you wisdom. Some of you are in need of provision. Some of you are in need of a fresh touch from the Lord. Some of you are needing to, to have God's wisdom, how you can show compassion in the situation that we just talked about, but God's speaking to your heart. Some of you just wanna be in the presence of the Lord, but I'm gonna ask you to do that prophetic act. I'm gonna ask you to get out of your chair, or out of your seat, come down here in the front, and and just say you know do it with the faith I believe as I go God's gonna take care of the thing I'm going for so right now the altar is open just step out we're gonna worship Lord I'm gonna pray over you here in just a second we're gonna believe God's gonna do something very powerful And then there's some of you, and you know, maybe it's your seat because the altar's gonna be jammed. Maybe it's your seat, you're just saying, I want more of God's presence on my life. And I'm really, Lord, I'm available. Across the, the auditorium, just say, Lord, I'm here, however you wanna use me, whatever it is you wanna do in my life, I'm here. So Lord, have your way, I'm available. Heavenly Father, you see you see every, everybody who stepped into the altar, and Lord, you know exactly what they need. Lord, you're not surprised by the needs or disappointed in the needs or overwhelmed by the needs. God, you're a God who delights when your people step out and say, God, you're the answer, and that's what everybody's done in this, in this altar. They're, they're acknowledging you alone hold the answer to the circumstances they face in life. And so, God, we look to you. We need you. Father, tonight I pray that in the hearts, the lives, the circumstances, the relationships, the finances, the decisions of those who've come into this altar, Lord, the circumstances that God you would individually meet every single person. Lord, there wouldn't be one person in this altar who wouldn't receive from you powerfully, dynamically, perfectly the thing they need. May they encounter your presence as we all together in this place encounter your presence. And Father, as we're in this time of worship, as they're seeking you, Lord, I just pray across this auditorium there would be just a, a sense of, Lord, I'm here, I'm open, I want to be used by you. And the Lord, as people reach out to you, you'd pour your spirit into them. And God, that you would 
you would use them in ways they couldn't begin to imagine. You know, the first key to being used by the Lord is to say, God, I'm available. Use me however you want. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we wanna connect with you on our online family. You can just click the link next to me to connect with us. As well, we would love if you would subscribe to the YouTube channel today and press that bell for notifications. You will be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content that helps you stay up to date with everything that's happening at James River Church. We hope you have a great day today and we'd love for you to join our live Sunday services every Sunday and Wednesday. Thank you again for watching. God bless.